I bought property. I regretted all the property purchases I did, every single one. Because had I put all that money in what I knew and what I truly believed in, it would have been. Today with me in the studio is Kylie Ng, the managing partner of 500 Global. For those of you who do not know Kylie, uh, Kylie is someone who is what well, the OG in the Malaysia startup scene. Exited two companies and currently right now the managing partner of 500 Global. Also a brand they brought into Malaysia, we would say that. But it wasn't always like that, right? Um, back then, you were just a normal kid high school and then from what I recall in my memory was suddenly there was this group of seniors who came up and then they finished their university and they were talking about startups and this guy Kylie who used to be my scout senior is running this thing called Youth Says mm. and after that the rest is history right mm. but it wasn't always like that so how was your relationship with money like before you entered into the startup world before you got all familiar with this money thing because were you from a business family were you already like grew up when you were young, you were like, oh, one day I'm going to be bloody rich, like that. Yeah. What was it like, actually? I never even wanted to be an entrepreneur, actually. Like, I didn't. I feel like a lot of the steps that led probably you to where you are, where anyone is there today, right? Like, for, for me, it's not, like, planned too much in advance. Like, there were a lot of very natural steps and natural interests that I was following. So the first kind of thing related to money, since it's uh, Mr. Money and a channel like this as well, is that uh, my family, we were not uh, rich. And we, in fact, like, at some point, like, I feel like the... The, the varying degrees of middle classness, you know, like it, it started from a memory where we would only eat McDonald's something like once a year for birthday or something, right? So it was quite modest from that standpoint. You know, and I grew up a family of like older brother, younger brother, I'd be wearing mostly my older brother's clothes, for example, right? And it's also come from a, a standpoint where both my parents will also come from extreme poverty, right? As, and I think a lot of uh, families who have uh, migrant parents and whatnot. So my dad was uh, a rubber tapper in a rubber tapper family, and he had like 11 other siblings. And he's like, he, he had 10 older siblings save up their life savings and he's the only one who went to college at the time for him to go to college. Oh. So it's, it's more like, even when we had some money, and I always suspected, I think my parents have more money than they act like it, right? But they're like, <laughs> but they're like inducing this poverty environment for us to grow up in so we'd be like better people, I guess. I don't know, yeah, you know right? Probably, but probably they, they eat once, once a year McDonald's, but maybe at night they would eat yeah. McDonald's. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll make or something. I don't know. But, but, it's, but, it's, but it's, it's like, uh, you know, I would compare market rate. Like, I tell me, hey, my friends, this uh, so-and-so allowance is this how much? So-and-so allowance, and I, I show them all my friends and what their allowances are. I say, how come mine's the lowest? Right? They said, no, like, this is good enough. Like, <laughs> Like, what do you what do you spend? You know, what do you want to buy, right? So I think that there was like a very frugal environment for for good reasons, right? So I think there's two things: one's absolute poverty, and one's relative poverty, then or induced poverty, like you know. But for the most point, is that I didn't feel the main thing was as a, as a child. How do you even process a lot of this? Is that I didn't feel like I can buy anything I wanted. Everything that I wanted to get, like, I just can't buy it because parents might not want to buy it for me. And, and, and full credit to them, they did buy me a lot of stuff that were, were great too. But as a child, you, you want endless things. You want endless toys. Then as a teenager, you want different clothes. You want different kind of things to kind of flex and show off and be up on part of your peers. I, 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 it wasn't within my reach. I didn't have that control. Right. So that may, gave me a certain thirst to actually make money. Right. It made me want to make money so that I can exercise some control over my environment, so I can exercise some freedom of expression. Right? Mm. So uh, in SMDJ at the time, um, I feel like everyone was wearing like different backpacks and it was a flex. Because yes. otherwise your shirt or your pants is more or less the same. That's right. Then the backpack was a flex, right? So, so you know, okay, you use a body pack, you know, or like, like what? East pack. Yeah, uh, East outdoor, pack. East pack. Yeah, uh, yeah. Outboard, the underneath got leather and like, yeah. wow, you know what I mean? Like, you know, oh, they're Yao Tin Yan or whatever. You know what I mean? It's just, that, that's a flex, right? <laughs> yes. So I was like, oh man, I need to get myself some of that gear. You know what I mean? Now, for a lot of these things, like the next big flex was mobile phones. Mm. So at the time, like, I think for, for our generation, as kids, we don't have mobile phones. But teenager, like some people start to have yep. it already. And they're, oh, what do you have? You have this uh, a Nokia 3310, the Tai Tao kind yes. of thing, right? Or, or you've got this uh, Nokia uh, 8210, small one, right? Yes, the smaller just, yeah, one. Yeah, smaller one, yeah. Yeah, so it's like, oh man, I got like big, I, I had like some Siemens or something. <laughs> <laughs> Nokia, you know, it's like some, I'm gonna forget what the brand was, you know, some of these dead brands like Alcatel or something like that, right? So, you know, anyways, so I was like, okay, I need, I need to get this phone. So I'm 15 years old. I said, okay, my gear, my, my mind's very simple. I'm gonna get a phone for myself. Parents, I don't have the allowance for it. Never mind, I'm gonna get myself this phone. So what are the strategies to obtain a phone when you're 15 going 16 years old? What are the strategies, right? Some of my uh, friends, they like, they, they take part-time jobs. Right? They'd get paid like an hourly wage at, I don't know, like doing some part-time work, right? Folding clothes or getting coffee or not, uh, serving coffee at Coffee Bean or something. Mm. So I did the math. If I'm going to work my entire vacation and all this money I save up 
I'm not going to be able to buy my mobile phone. It's just not enough. So I can't do an hourly thing. I have to find something that's non-hourly, something that is actually a little bit different. So there's this one kid, um, his name is TJ, and full credit to him, you know, he's, 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 he's really changed my life in that way, right? He was like doing his own thing. He was like, he was like coding. And he was building websites. Ooh. Yeah, he was building websites, right? And then uh, he said, oh, because some friend's brother in Singapore, they built like some website for a client, 20,000 sing in two weeks. Whoa. So I hit French brother, 17 years old, I'm 15, almost the same one. I, I also can build a website for Singapore also, right? So that's my thinking, <laughs> right? So, so, so I spent my whole vacation learning how to build websites so that I can buy that phone. Right. So I'll be flipping newspapers. Okay, well, after you learn how to build a website and, and you know, HTML, CSS, build PHP, build my SQL, you learn some basic coding and Photoshop and all that. You need to get clients. Mm. So then I would have to flip newspapers. So what my tactic was, I'll flip newspapers to see if there are any ads that had, um, had, had advertisers that had phone numbers but no websites. Mm. Then I call the phone number and say, hey, I was looking for a website. Oh, no website. Uh. <laughs> then I'll pitch her. Uh. Right? No website. Uh. Yeah. yeah. Hey, by the way, I know a big website. Yeah, no yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, so that's, that's like the, so the long story short on that is that the earlier, sec, the earlier chapter of the relationship with money is that, okay, I want to get money so I can buy things I want to buy. Right. And then like I work and learn new things and push myself to find ways to buy what I need to buy. So once I obtained that ability, I was like, wow. So what else, how much more money do I want to make and what do I have to do? Right. And so that really led me on a certain trajectory, right? And sometimes it's not even for me, the money's not even for me. Like I was in like, what's that, the Leo Club, mm. right? And then we do like this fundraiser, International Understanding Night. Yes. Are you Night, Are Night, yeah. Are you Night, yeah, yeah. So like fundraising and stuff, right? So I was like fundraising for that stuff. You know, I broke all their fundraising records for an entire club. Uh, and at the time, I mean, it seemed like a lot of money. La, but you know, I, I raised a 16,600 ringgit for one event. Then um, the margins were only 3, 4K only. So it's like, uh, I mean, the cost of goods sold was only 3, 4K. So, I, so the, the society pocketed like a good close to 12,000. And so that amount of money in that short amount of time, how do I galvanize volunteers of students of over 100 plus students to perform? How to arrange everything? Like all that, that was done while I was trying to prepare for SPM. Mm -hmm. But doing this Ionite thing was more interesting to me than SPM. And, yeah. and you know, it, it, especially like, it's so formative, you know, like as a, as a young teenager, mm. you suddenly understand how to calculate money and you start uh, understand how to calculate time mm. and you understand how to paint a picture, a dream for people to get excited about, mm. to be able to do something together. And then when you raise that amount of money and, and that we could use for the club and society or to enhance the school, then everyone wins. That's right. Like how amazing is that? So I think that like that changed that relationship with money from that of like, oh, I don't have enough money to buy. Oh, I cannot afford this to like, okay, if I really want it, what do I have to do? And I think that's like the unlock, right? right. From the first chapter. Right. Now, I think you, you wanted to ask a little bit about going into the startup days, right? That's right. So yeah. that's a natural extension, right? From building websites, I started to see that this weird feeling in me that the internet is going to change everything. And, it, and for today, people tuning into this would be like, this is such a weird thing to say. I mean, uh, you know what I mean? Because the yeah. internet has already changed everything. But at the time, it's not like that. Like everything you did, you had to like go somewhere, you had to drive somewhere, you get somebody to drive you somewhere. Mm -hmm. There's like forms to fill, you know? The first time, I mean, do people remember the first time they downloaded MP3? Do you remember the first time you actually bought a plane ticket online? Do you remember the first time you actually got your what, my card la, or whatever I see kind of done in an online way? It's, it's actually like, it's, it's a massive yeah. difference right. in terms of productivity and time. And then the, the information that you get. So the excitement of the internet like lived, it boiled my blood. Like it really made me want to kind of like be involved in something massive. Wow. So, so, uh, so through school, all I was doing was like being involved in clubs and societies, raising money, doing small businesses, doing different kind of hacks. And so eventually when I graduated, I wanted to get involved in business in some, some big way and build some web products. And eventually uh, I, 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 you know, I, I, went, I joined a company called Mind Valley at the time that would, was involved in doing these web products. Mm. I learned what I did and eventually set up to set up my own things. Mm. So I partnered with uh, Joel Neal at the time, he's like, he's like a friend of mine, and he's also very intense and very ambitious as well. And I really liked the work ethic and the speed that he was having. And we both had the same mindset. We were 23, 24. All we wanted to do was to work. Like we, we're not interested in like going out, spending time, sitting around, nothing. Like we slept over at each other's houses and we would spend three weeks just like non-stop working. And to me, I look back on all that, it's like the best time. It's one of the, like, the best feelings. You got this rush. You're like, you're in state of flow, but you're like flowing for weeks, you know? So, um, and we tried a lot of different businesses, you know, like you mentioned Youth Says or this, a lot of forgotten names, right? The ones that actually worked and persisted is like a media company called Says.com. Yep. And for Says.com, um, it's, I mean, today being like the media giant that it is, you know, for being like a 20 something year old person who's hiring a bunch of other 20 something year old folks, like we are a bunch of kids in a room, okay? 
to build a company that at, some, at one point had more traffic than the Star and Malaysia Kitty, that was monetizing the first year revenue was one million, you know, next year was like four, and it was nine, and it was like 13 million ringgit, right? It's just like, it's a profitable machine. The culture was our own culture. The vibe was our own vibe. The style, everything we wanted to do, we could express the source fully. And it was financially gaining so much momentum. And eventually listing that entity with Katja yep. in Bursa on the stock exchange. And then eventually having Mita Prima and Astro both saying, that, oh my God, these digital guys are going to kill us. We have to buy them. And eventually having Mita Prima <laughs> buy it for over 105 million ringgit. And then I'm like 30 years old. I'm like crazy. And not to forget, like along the way, we're like, oh, this other idea is very good. Oh, let's launch this group buying thing. Three months, Groupon acquired it as well. So it was like a weird thing, you know, this kind of conditioning. Because by the age of 30, like my body and my mind is telling me, if there's anything that you wanted to do, there was a way to get it done. And that it's okay if you're young. It's okay if you have never done it before. It's totally okay if like you're doing it in a way that everyone thinks is weird but somehow like you keep at it, that's a way that it can succeed in a big way. Yeah. So how does that influence my relationship with money? I don't know, you tell me, man. It's like, at this point, <laughs> it's like, I don't know. But I have to run it on one thing, lah, right? Was that um, my kind of observation, and, I, and a lot of my observations come from my confusion. So growing up in SMK DJ, I was very, very confused about why some of my friends followed football and they would support different clubs because I wasn't really into football and I couldn't make myself into it. So I felt a bit left out by it. But how they're, they're like staying up at night watching, oh, Manchester United versus say Arsenal or whatever, right? And then they're like, oh, next day they wake up like, yeah, my team lost, I'm so sad. I'm like, hey, they don't know you, you don't know them, why are you sad? <laughs> like, why, why are you so sad, right? You guys have nothing <laughs> to do with each other. Like, why are you sad, yeah. right? But when I fast forward to today, um, or, or, or through like the entrepreneurial process of building things with people, is that if your heart is connected to a football team, or if your heart is connected to a company, or if your heart is connected to your colleagues, if they win, you will also be happy. Mm -hmm. Their happiness is actually your happiness. Mm -hmm. Like the, the mirror neurons that our brains were, were born with somehow had made that connection already that, that cannot differentiate the quality of their emotion. So whether the football team that you love wins, you'll be happy. Football team loses, you'll be unhappy. Same thing with your company. Yep. If you truly love the company and the people you work with, their happiness is your happiness. Yeah. So then we talk about money, right? Is that the the money that we have made at sales.com, I was very, very intent to retain people and give them share options in the company. And the interesting thing about that is that share options at the time, and even till today, a lot of people don't understand what the value of these share options yep. are. Some of them say, hey, Kylie, give me a bonus, lah. what is this? Mm, right? It's mm. like, this bonus is cash, right? But the thing is, I wanted to give them shares of the company because I wanted them to win when I won. Yep. So we are, we are, we are, we are, we are quantum entangled already, you know, like yes. we are in the same boat already, you know? we are partners in this already, right? So I'm proud to say that when we had like a, a, a the, the, the kind of the financial outcomes that uh, sales.com and the group small journey had, one of my colleagues, you know, come from single mom family, multiple siblings, you know, in a second city, you know, like bought mom a house and a car, you know, these kind of things, it, it, it warms your heart, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's just one of many stories, you know, of the things that people do. And, and in the later chapters, we have talked about venture capital and what do entrepreneurs do once they also make a lot of money. I'll tell you a lot of amazing stories as well, right? You really see the good in people. So later, we're definitely going to touch on that, on share options and also for employees on how they can actually ride along the startup journey and become rich together with the founders, right? Uh, but before that, let's touch a little bit on uh, this whole journey that you had from sure. school, learning about money, and then creating a value and then making money out of it, right? Yeah. So firstly is this, right? Uh, prior to graduation itself, you were already running multiple business, right? So by the time you graduate, you're already quite used to it. Okay. And subsequently, when you exited, you also exited with a good sum of money, yeah? yeah? Which is the part that I want to touch before okay. we go into the employee. Yeah, sure, 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 of course. So yeah. let's take a quick break and we're going to come back for the part two. Hey everyone, I hope you are enjoying the content from this video. If you enjoy content that can help you make better decisions in money and life, well, check out our other channels here as well. I remember the time I was an intern in Omnicom. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. And yeah, your yeah, team came in and gave a pitch. Shit, I didn't even know you were in Omnicom. <laughs> so at that time I was like, Wow, isn't this the company that was started by Kylie, my senior? And right now, he have a few staff and they are coming here to pitch to a multinational media company on their product. And once I graduated, I recall I went to The Curve, The Curve just opened, and Chris, yeah. all of them were working there. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. And they told me that they joined you. Yeah. And literally at that time in my mind, I was thinking, huh, can one? Uh? Yeah. 
all this 20 year old over dudes all working together with each other and, and your senior at school now is your boss. It was a very foreign concept to me because that time our parents were still like, hey, you know, when you come out of work, you better work for a multinational company, you know. It was still a very standard career path kind of thing. And if you think about business, we will be thinking about opening up a cafe or a restaurant, you know, traditional kind of stuff, right? Now, subsequently, to my amazement, I heard that says exit and exit with uh, Catch Up Media at 60 million ringgit. Yeah. Subsequently, a few years later in 2017, so to Media Prima under the name of Rap Asia, yeah. and that was a 105 million deal, right? Yeah. Which was massive. And on top of that, also there was Groupon, yeah. that part where I bought in. And it really inspired me. It made me realize that I never thought that 20 year old over people can achieve such a thing. And there's such thing as startup, and there's such thing as raising fund, exiting, you know, all these kind of things. It, it all just seemed so foreign to me, right? It definitely did inspire me on my own path yeah. uh, many years later. Yeah. yeah. But the question to you is this, after you exit, how much you exit with? Because yeah. along the way, there were a lot of dilution, yeah. right? So yeah. do you mind sharing me like when you exit, yeah. how much was the actual money that you got? For every entrepreneur journey, there's like investment and then there are like different partners, different co-founders and how much you share with your people. So some of this are very public information. So actually you can Google here and there if you want, lah, right? But the, for the most part is that like uh, the quantum itself and how much money is not like the important part. I think earlier in the first part when I talked about the journey is that the initial hit of like seeing extra zeros in your bank, that's quite, I mean, it's permanent if you don't spend it first off, but, if, but for the most part is that that wears out after a while. Mm. And so my angel investor, Steve, who he himself had built and sold multi-million dollar companies as well, his advice to me and my co-founder Joel at the time was that don't do anything with the money you've made. Mm. You know, don't go ahead and do anything. Just let it sit for a few months. Maybe you cut yourself two months, three months. Just let it sit. Don't do anything. And then you just like wait for a while. Kind of let, let the feelings pass first. And then later you can re-engage. Mm. And we followed that advice. It was very sound advice. And we can talk about investing and other things later. But it actually applies at every level. It doesn't have to have a very big sum. So if you look at a lot of folks, maybe they get bonus or they get payday then maybe the first thing they do is actually to spend, right? Or maybe to treat yourself, right? And I mean, that's fine, you know, like I think everyone deserves that too. But what if every time you actually got paid, you actually chill and do absolutely nothing? I'm not even asking you to save or invest or anything, just do nothing. So I, I feel like that's like a very meta thing to do because yep. you're actually building a different relationship with money, you know, uh, whether or not you choose to get excited or not with it, right? So while I'm choosing not to answer your question directly, right? But I do think what's more important uh, with, uh, with that is that um, there's a whole body of um, emotions that start to get built around the journey of getting money, having money, and then spending money, and what you use with money. And I think that emotional journey and the thoughts and the feelings that go around it can make someone feel rich mm. or can make someone feel poor. Right. Can make someone help others become richer and more prosperous or can help someone actually, um, how you say, disempower other people mm. as well. So to me, like uh, over since age 30 of like um, having those kind of like outcomes and fast forwarding today, I've like given that considerable amount of thought. Also because in my current day career is that I'm face to face raising money from some of the richest people in the world, right? And I'm also making some of my entrepreneurs wildly successful so they can become the next richest people in the world too. And so it's, it's, it's just a real relative way, you know, like your brain really has to kind of like rewire the way you look at it yeah right? you, you kind of got a, a center around things and then when i think about all that i can also kind of listen to my past self i'll give an example right when building companies from age 20 to 30 or 20, rather 24 to 30 my salary was 2000 ringgit no it was actually 1500 ringgit what we paid to ourselves and just like bare minimums and just buy food right roti chanai you know mineral water you know uh, or maybe at the time i wasn't vegan yet so i eat like chicken rice and you know it's just like Everything is like pretty well calculated. Thousand five, just enough to survive, right? Pay petrol, how much a month? Everything was calculated. Thousand five, that's it, right? Because we want to have as much runway as possible. So our relationship with money is very, very different, right? The the way we want to see like what's enough. Mm. But some people they can't stand having thousand five salary. Then we upgrade our salary at one point to what two thousand three hundred ringgit or something, right? And we're twenty eight years old. How many twenty eight years old today? Uh, uh, would we if they, if their friends are earning more than two thousand three, they may want to earn more too. They may just compare it to their friends. They're like, oh, like. Oh my! I, oh, I got so and so friend or book in so and so company earning four thousand. How come I'm earning only two thousand three? For example, they will think to themselves. Then maybe they think they're stupid, or maybe they think they made a mistake. Then maybe they forget they're actually like learning much more on their friend. Maybe they forget that their friend's miserable mm. and the boss is terrible or whatever it is. Are right? Like it, it's it's kind of like um, I I, I want to bring that attention to 
the idea is that the relationship with money, the emotions with money, and the stories about money is as important as that journey of getting money and yep. making money too. Mm. Right? But I don't know if this is interesting to you or not. Yeah, this is definitely a one subject that we'll talk about. But I'm curious, right, uh, before we go into that part, is you definitely went from nothing yep. right, to a relatively small amount of wealth as you're building it, making it a profitable business. And uh, after that, exiting, which definitely, definitely was yeah. more than a million dollar kind of yeah. numbers, right? Yeah. yeah, how many millions? That's the question, yeah. right? Uh, we'll leave that as a mystery, right? Yeah. Uh, however, I do recall yeah. a friend of mine did told me at one point, he said, when I saw that money, I decided to withdraw it and just spread it out on our bed. And we just swim in it for a while and then put it back inside the bank. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was one of your employees. Yeah. Oh, for, his, for his or her money, yeah, is for, it? For his portion. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> oh, his, his portion yeah. might not be that big. You, you may be otherwise, guess the bid, who's otherwise, the... otherwise, the bid would have to be a bit bigger. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, like... So he said, he's never seen so much money. He took it out, spread it on the bread. Wow, Last really? Then just swim around, then collect it back, <laughs> then they bang it back. <laughs> I, 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 well, I didn't do that, man. It's a Scrooge McDuck yeah. move, you know what I mean? You should ask uh, who the employees are. Yeah, I think I didn't figure out who the one is. That's very funny way to do. Okay, okay. I think I see where you want to lead the curiosity. Okay, so I think what I'm saying, what you're signposting here from nothing to something, Lah, right? Yeah. And then how did that change me as a person? Is yes. that it? So from there, okay. and you talk about this whole relationship with money, right? Yeah. Now I, I thought it was a very good move that yeah. your investor at that time actually gave you the advice yeah. not to actually look at the money yeah, yeah, yeah. for just leave it there for yeah, two yeah, weeks, yeah, right? Yeah. And it kinda calms your nerves down, yeah, yeah. readjust yourself. Yeah. But and by doing that, right, how did it change your perspective to this thing? Because I, I can imagine a 28-year-old guy, you have been suffering for so long, paying yeah. yourself only that little yeah, money. Yeah, yeah. Suddenly you know, you've got a few millions yeah, in your bank account, right? Yeah, how many yeah. millions? Another story. Yeah. But you could have just really buy yourself a nice car. You could have done yeah. so many things. Maybe it's the time yeah. for you to buy the Rolex. Maybe yeah, yeah, time for you to go with flex, right? At yeah, least yeah, live yeah, that yeah, life, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. How was it like? Did it change you? Now, first thing I had to qualify the, some, the nothing to something. Like, I don't want to over dramatize it either because I grew up in a comfortable enough family, right? Because eventually, like, my dad did start to grow in a company that he was with. And so uh, it was comfortable, middle class enough. So the worst case scenario is that, like, they, I was living in my parents' house, so I didn't have to pay rent, right? And not, not many people have that either, right? Number two is that, like, if I'm completely unemployed, I know my mom's going to feed me. Do you know what I mean? So at the base of my mind, like, that nothing was actually something. Mm. So, which is why, like, a lot of people have, have asked, oh, do you feel failure? There's no existential physical failure. I'm going to have a roof over my head, a comfortable enough roof over my head, and I'm going to have food. So the only failure is actually psychological failure. Mm. That you have this idea of success and that doesn't actually happen, right? So that's, that nothing was actually something. And I have full credit to my parents. Because even though they didn't buy me a lot of like, you know, branded items or whatnot, they bought me computers. Any new computer I wanted to get, like they would say, okay, is this better than old computer? Yes, okay. They don't even know how to use it. They just buy for us. I'm going to buy my kid computer. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, man. These days, you're going to try to limit screen time. But it's like, <laughs> but, the, but, but, the, but, but, you know, so I just want to say that, so, that it's not nothing, la, there's something. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But if you fast forward to like something more, I mean, I think everyone has their own kind of like uh, indulgences. And if I were to post-rationalize what I bought and what I didn't buy now, I bought property. It was the first I thing bought you did. property. Now, why property, right? I regretted all the property purchases I did. Every single one. Because had I put all that money in what I knew and what I truly believed in and I really listened to myself, it would have been Apple stock and Google stock. Mm. And the price of the Apple stock and Google stock at the time versus today. I, you didn't buy any Apple stock, Google stock? No, you, I didn't. You, you threw the money all in property. Later on, I did. Later on, I Later did. Later on, no. But, I, but, but the, the, early days. the sequencing, yeah. And those days, like if I just tracked the stock price, completely different. Because the thing is, I'm, I'm a product of the internet, right? And yeah, I, know, right. I know how many people are using Google and what kind of revenue that's sources right. they're I, You I made money them, there. I knew them in and out, yeah, of Google, <laughs> of Apple, and then Facebook. Like I knew all about it, but I didn't go hard on what I actually believed in. But instead, what I believed in was a lot of the, um, the, the kind of like the, 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 traditional. the traditional or play safe a little bit. And I, I'm not discounting that wisdom yeah, because there's wisdom in, there the wisdom in that. There's yeah. wisdom in diversification. But if you want to objectively talk about financial outcomes, that would have been a much better financial outcome. Do you know what I mean? Way, yeah. way better, right? And I'm not saying that's true today, but it's true then. Because the momentum of all property make money kind of thing of our parents' generation, it was true at the time because of interest rates, development, and other factors, right? So it's very easy to kind of mm -hmm. roll the money on that stuff. That conditions may not be the same today. That's right. But with technology, also conditions may be a little bit different today, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go into all of that. But the first thing I did is that I bought property. And when I look back, kind of like wish I didn't, wish I listened to myself in the first place. Second thing is that I, well, I'll tell you what I didn't buy. Till today, I've not purchased a car. 
I've always used second-hand vehicles that my parents, like I was driving like a beat up Proton Vera for a long time, like one of my mom's first cars or whatnot. So and I have the luxury of having secondhand cars for my parents and not many people have that luxury, right? So to me, it's luxury. So this year, okay, at, at age 40, okay, I'm like, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm gonna buy a car. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know, after all these years, maybe I'm gonna buy a car, right? I have, I have reasons, you know, because like my maybe, wife, maybe, 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 because maybe. my wife and I so like. I haven't bought a car until today. No, I've not, because my wife and I like she she does a lot of like uh, a lot of social work, and then like it takes her into like the some very rough areas sometimes, and we thought okay, get four wheel drive, and then you know stuff like that lah. It's like okay, maybe for functionally, for more for functional, functionally reasons, would right? probably you know do that because I can't like we can't grab to those places, right? And then like she's driving like a really old car, the first car that she bought before we met. So I said, okay, maybe you buy a car. But then I decided to say, hey, I'm gonna ask my dad, hey, do you have an old car sitting around that you don't want anymore? He said, he's got a 12 year old BMW that he bought when he retired. They say, can you use that? Okay, I drive for a few weeks. Okay, nice. I'm, I'm, I'm driving this 12 year old BMW now, right? So, okay, my dad wanted to sell it at first, but like, I think the, the market rate was like 40,000 ringgit or whatever, right? So right. it was actually only at 13, right. 40,000 ringgit. It was actually quite bad. But, but so instead of selling, he just like left it around and drive it. Okay, la, I'm driving now. La. Okay. So, so, okay, when you're 30 plus, yeah. you made your millions, yeah. you're driving a beat up used Proton Mira. At that time, it was a Gen 2. A Gen 2. Yeah, I'm, I'm, but it was also a very old beat up. And today, yeah. Today you're driving a twelve-year-old uh, BMW as well. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. All right. But, but along the way, I have I, I because we are very early investors in Grab, and like I I've known the founder of Grab, Anthony, since the media days, you know, and so yep. I was one of the earliest users of my taxi. So I I, I spent a lot of money on my taxi and Grab right. as a customer, right? I'm like the heaviest <laughs> user and one of the earliest users, right? So yeah, so in a way, who knows? Maybe if I bought a car and drove around, I wouldn't have seen the value in my taxi, right? Like you that's know, true, that's yeah, true. it's kind of hard that's to say. True, right? that's true. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Aside from that, was there any crazy luxuries that you bought that you kind of like go, ah, maybe I should have splurged my money that way? I made a big mistake on fashion. Mm. Because you see, like at the time, like I couldn't express myself creatively and, and fashionably for a very long time. So I've this pent up, like say, oh, what if I could actually buy this shirt or this pants or whatever, like more shoes, you know? So I felt that, okay, maybe I'll do that. Property is one thing. Uh, oh, well, let me talk about property. One of the properties that I lived in, one thing that I get a lot of energy from is like physical environment. So. I, 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 bought a, I bought an apartment that I, I mean to me, la, I thought the design was nice, right? You know, some, a lot of people may argue, but I did it because it gave me a lot of energy. So I do think that like, if some people are buying cars, I'm not shitting on people buying cars or whatnot, but if some people buy cars and get a lot of energy from it, mm -hmm. it's more power to them. That means they can reuse the energy to do more things as well, right? That's right. So money, energy is like very similar currency, right? So you just get that, you know, they get that charge and you go in and do something. So with property, um, I, I wanted to buy more clothes. And so I just became a shopaholic. Wait, with property you wonder about? So uh, no, with, so that... with, with property, I, had, I could buy a bigger wardrobe. I could afford a bigger wardrobe. <laughs> And then suddenly, you know, when you got more space, you start filling things up, right? Okay. So the wardrobe was bigger. So you went in and you said, mm, I can fill it up. Yeah, then it was so, so then you kind of like feel, you know, if wardrobe was smaller, then you, right. you may feel okay. like you have too much clothes, right? But then because the property was bigger, right. I was like, oh, okay. Like, I can fill it up. I said, I, should, I, I can have more clothes. You know what I mean? And I started being a, a kind of a bit of a shopaholic, you know, so I had a lot of clothes. So were you yeah. like buying a lot of branded clothes or were you just no, like, buying a bit, awesome clothes? I think the cheapskate in me still cannot. <laughs> <laughs> like, the bootstrap thing still don't go away, right? No, 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 but, but you know, I, I, I want to I like be philosophical <laughs> about even branded items. Let's talk about it for a second, right? Like, 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 like maybe yeah. a bit All later. Right, right. Okay, let me complete this first point about clothes first, right? <laughs> It's because like even though I because because my need was to express myself, not yes, necessarily yes. to kind of flex with brands, right? That's right. Because brand brands like a lot of it's a flex as well, right? So That's right. and some of it's quality, I mean you may argue, but you know what I mean? Anyways, so I bought a lot of clothes, but I realized it was completely stupid. And so I went 360. So I was I think age about 33 at the time. Uh, and I was like, I was like, I've got shoes that I don't I bought and I didn't even wear yet, you know, and I was just like, this is so stupid. And so I went 360. Uh, I read this book called Essentialism that a friend recommended to me and I really resonated with that and it was a, quite a good reverse. So I said, okay, I'm going to give away a lot of these clothes. I sold quite a few of it on Carousel for those who get, that can be sold, you know, also a, a company we invested in. But, um, but I, I gave away most of it. I landed with seven outfits, all of which were black. And then I started traveling and then I got rid of, uh, was that I, I rented out my apartment uh, that I was living in at, at the time as well. And then I just started traveling. And a lot of it's because of the work I was involved in, which is venture capital and other things. But, you know, I just lived on a, a backpack with seven outfits. And that was, a, that, was, that was a detox for me. Wow. That was like a major detox for me. Because again, we talk about the psychology of money, right? It's like, it's not even about buying a lot of clothes or buying more clothes, you know? It's like, why do I even want clothes? Like, what is it? It was just a knee-jerk reaction for a long time being deprived of having fashionable expression that of levels that I wanted to. And then at some point, I was like, hey, I think I've gone overboard with this. 
And the thing is that if I didn't stop myself, what other kind of like addictions would happen? Like, and why was I buying? Because I'm thinking that if I spend that money to obtain this object, that means I'll be happy. That means I'm giving the power of happiness to these objects, you know. So then let's talk about brands for a second, right? Yep. The thriftiness that I was that I grew up with, that I identify with, that thriftiness, in and of itself, I started to see it as the other side of spendthriftness. Over thriftiness and over spendthriftness, it's actually both sides of the same coin. It's actually like an uncontrollable relationship with money that dominates your spending behavior. Yep. So the unifying factor between thriftiness and spendthriftness is that you have no control mm. of your impulses. No control. Hence, like, um, what I did in my money experiments, number one is be go back to my thriftiness and go back to super essentialism and minimalism for a while. But later on, I was saying that I've never bought clothes that are, like, more than a like few hundred ringgit before. You know, I said, what if I bought a jacket that was 2,000 ringgit? All of me is saying that that is a complete ripoff. It's like you're just paying for some dumbass brand. And like, so, all, so much of me is like violently opposed to spending money on those brands and paying for that. So I said, it's complete bullshit. But I said, you know what? I have to crush that. I have to kind of like loosen my beliefs with money so that I will have more control and more fluidity, mm. you know, and just you, you loosen that attachment. So I forced myself to say, okay, I'm just gonna buy this like 2,000 ringgit, like it was like a hoodie kind of thing, you know, it's a paid 2,000 ringgit for it. I felt like an idiot for a few weeks. In fact, I didn't even wear it for a few months, but it was like the first purchase that broke the, that loosened up. Yeah, the other side. Yeah, the other yeah, side yeah, as yeah. well, right? So again, I'm doing this because like, I think that journey of introspection is rewarding for me. And what it gives me as a result is that like, I can have a relationship with yeah, money. in control of it. Right? Yes, and, and the thing is, I'm not living for money anymore in that sense. You know, I've, I can make certain decisions in a more balanced view. Mm. So let's talk about charity for a second. So at, at, for the longest time, like, uh, even though a, a lot of the, the high school stuff is for charity, but like my own money, my own so-called hard-earned money to give to charity, like that, that like it wasn't, at least in my 20s, it wasn't a very immediate thing. It wasn't like something I sit down and say, okay, you know, I'm going to donate to something today. It wasn't like that, right? It was more like a very emo in the moment, maybe I give something, right? But it's like, you know, but I didn't intentionally go out and give. So the first time I actually, on my own accord, started to uh, raise funds for a cause, that was the first time that, uh, and not only I put my own money, I got a lot of people to put money in it as well. That also is a different way to rewire a relationship with money. So for my wife and I, I mean, for her, she's, she's uh, a lot of it is inspiration to her as well, uh, her and her social work and her charity work. And I'm exposed to, again, earlier on, I think we've talked about connecting your hearts to other people. There's a multiplication of happiness when it comes to like charity. And I'm not talking about like, oh, you make a lot of money so you can sit here and talk about charity. It's not like that. It's more like you see like the way even people who have no money do charity. You know, I'll give you a, a story then I try to conclude this point, right? So um, she leads this organization called Kacha Soup Kitchen Society, amongst many things. And she told me a story about one of the clients that they are feeding, one of the homeless clients that they were feeding for many years. Now, the homeless client eventually like, uh, got a job. And every now and then, he'll come by physically and donate 10 ringgit. So you think about like, the relationship that he's built with money, the amount of gratitude, you know, and the amount of like, that, that kind of flow. It's a way that doesn't cause... I mean, like, I, I think at least my, my fantasy of it, I think that's a beautiful thing. And this thing that I can kind of like, at least I'm trying to engender a little bit more. Otherwise, for the most of your life, some emotions that come coupled with money is anxiety, or oh, do we have enough, or oh, I don't have enough. And maybe you're like super rich really, oh, but I don't have enough, you know? It's like, it, it can still imprison you. Yeah. Yeah. So hence, I feel like getting a lot of um, loosening up some beliefs and having some play, mm. having a bit of a playground with yourself with it, like that was what, after I made some money, it kind of at least created an environment that got me more curious about it. Right, so that's that's I don't know if that kind of answers. Yeah, the question that resonates because uh, I think very often when we look at money, we tend to think that uh, the problem we, we have with money when we do not when we have this issue with money usually is when we do not have money. But the truth is, when you have money, you also have issues with money. Just like what you say, right? So too much of money, and then you do not know how to spend spend it. Uh, you become an impulsive spender. You're also being imprisoned by your concept of money. So the, uh, you know that's an interesting uh, point of debate. Like uh, let's say the hip hop, unfortunately, has pop popularized like more money, more problems. You know, kind of thing. But but you know the relationship is also non-linear. So let me, yeah. let me let me unpack this. Right, if you have a certain psychology, 
that psychology is amplified when you have more money. And so if you have less money, maybe there are certain parts of you that are unexpressed because you could not, you don't have the means to actually express them. But I'm not saying that, like, but those means may be bad. Like some, so Sarah Blakely, which is the youngest self-made female billionaire, like I was reading a lot about what she was doing because I find her very inspirational. And so in one Forbes article, she said that her belief, because she was asked a very similar question, like when you had more money, like how have you become different? She said that she has become more social and she likes to throw a lot of parties and get a lot of friends together because mm. she's always been a social community vibe type person. So when she had more money, she did more of that, right? But she's also seen some other friends who are always assholes and jerks who, when they had more money, they also became bigger assholes and bigger jerks. So you kind of like think a little bit, like you just, more money just makes you more of who you already are. It unravels who you are, mm. right? It gives That's you right. space to actually unravel who you are. If you're too busy kind of like working and trying to get money, sometimes you, you don't have time to think of who you are. You don't have, you, you, or rather you don't invest that time to think of who you are or express who you are fully, right? So more money, sometimes it, it's, it's scary for you because like, who are you really? Yep. Then you, you got to face that, right? But anyways, coming back to uh, more money, more problems. Um, fundamentally, the entrepreneurial journey and the kind of like the mindset um, involves having a different relationship with problems. Because even the word problems, right? People are like, oh, man, I don't want more problems. I got too much problems in my life. You know what I mean? But if you solve problems, it unlocks value and you can actually That's make right. money. So the, the belief I have is more problems, more money, actually. It, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, if you really want to make more money, it's like, what are some of the biggest problems yes. facing humanity Look today? Problems. Look for these big <laughs> problems, right? Big problems, big money, right? There's also some non-linearity in that too, but I don't want to get too technical. But it, 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 it's important for people to have the ability to inverse their thinking often. And it's very important for, um, for folks to have some nuance around feelings, emotions, beliefs, stories that somehow attach to money. Because it's in that introspection that people will find the freedom. It gives you more options at the very least. Yep. And I think it's more and more important now with the advent of social media, and it's very responsible that you have Mr. Money as a channel like this because you're encouraging conversations in the dialogue. You know, the other guests that you have, they, they, they have a different perspective. And so for any of the audience tuning in to Mr. Money, they can at least digest multiple perspectives around these topics and then they can say, okay, what am I, what's my next move? Mm. Having heard all of this, right? So I think that's even more important now than ever uh, in this ultra-capitalist consumer society that we're in to have moments of reflection and introspection so you can choose your own strategy. So one thing I got from this, uh, from the way they talked about it, is that ultimately we need to understand that money is a way that, that gives us the option to express ourselves. Yes. And that's very true, right? Because I've seen people who are very rich when they hit their first jackpot, right? And they made the money. They choose not to buy a house, but they love cars. They yeah, yeah house, exactly, exactly. Right? And they're happy that way. Exactly, right? gives them energy. And, yeah. and they're rich enough to, yeah. to be able to say, you can't go and tell them you buy a yeah. car, you're wasting money, it's not yeah. no value. Bro, I'm already making money elsewhere. Yeah, you know? it doesn't matter. Yeah. Think, it doesn't matter, it's for my entertainment. And I personally also went through a journey. I'm not that rich, right? Uh, not, not at all rich, yeah, but good enough to live a comfortable life right now. Uh, I went from driving a BMW to today, I, I don't mind driving an Ativa. Yeah. yeah, but I can use that money to go for sports. Exactly, yeah. exactly. No, you gym, nailed it, no, you nailed I, it. And yeah, that, and that, I'm pretty much happy. See, and, and that kind of psychological <laughs> flexibility is actually, to me, like some of the feelings of wealth that you can experience. That's right. Because, like, it, it, because so in startups, they call like minute, like, say, burn rate or run rate. You know, there are some of these terms, right? But if you have a minimum, if let's say you can be happy by spending very little, you have so much space, you have so much margins for happiness. You know? Yes. It's huge. Your margin for happiness is very huge. But if you require such a high amount of money for you to feel mm. like you're successful, you are doomed to have a low margin life, you know. Oh, low that's margin. That's a very good way life, of describing you know? it. Yeah, yeah that's a very good way of describing it. Yeah, so you so so I think that it is quite fun to see how happy can you be by reducing what you need in order to feel free, to feel loved. So that you have the margin for happiness. Exactly. That's a perfect one. And with absolute expansive margins, you can help other people be happy. That's and right. And if, if those are causes and people you care about, your happiness is multiplied. That's right. Yeah. You know, our brain, you only got 24 hours a day to experience whatever happiness you have and you only have this certain neurochemistry for it. But if the mirror neurons allow you to attach that and, and with somebody else, that's great. Then you get this multiplication of happiness, but with, with these margins, right? So Fantastic. So now we're going to take a break and we're going to come back for the next section uh, yeah. where we're going to talk about the next part of the story, yeah. where after you learn about money and now you're in the VC business yeah. and uh, we're going to touch on how you use your money to actually make a greater impact. <laughs> 
Hey everyone, I hope you are enjoying the content from this video. If you enjoy content that can help you make better decisions in money and life, well, check out our other channels here as well. Alright, now we are back to the third part. Uh, now, Kylie, we have talked about uh, money being an expression of who you are. And I guess you have already found that expression of who you are, which is someone who is a venture builder, right? Yeah, and you brought in 500 startups into Malaysia. And you talked about this in one of the interviews. You talked about redefining capitalism and spreading the weapon of mass creation. Can you share with us a little bit more on what do you mean by that? Yeah, I think like the journey of like at least deciding on a new chapter because that's like turning 30. I'm saying, okay, how do I, what's my road to 40, right? From 30 to 40, like what do I want to spend my time on? So I think that the, um, to, to describe what I do for a living and the mission that I chose, it actually stems from our earlier conversation about money as well. I mean, of course, like, there's a lot of options of things to do. Uh, and I did take some time to figure out what the next chapter is. But when I started to identify more deeply with the things that made me angry, right? So sometimes you say, oh, what's your passion? You know, it sounds like a pleasurable thing. But I, I was quite taken by one uh, um, concept by the, the author of uh, Tribal Leadership. He had this new book called, Dave Logan is his name. He had this book at the time called The Dark Side of Leadership, where he says that a lot of your strength and your passion can be also found in what makes you angry. Like what kind of feels like it's unfair, you know, or right. you know, something that you feel, you know, something that, that... So for me, I was thinking that, okay, what's happening in the world now? I had a lot of time to think about these things. People talk about rich getting rich and poor getting poor, for example, right? Where you got wealth disparity. And then I thought about, okay, well, if you got wealth disparity in a country, that can be measured by a Gini index, for example. But how about wealth disparity between countries? How about rich countries getting richer and poor countries getting poorer? Mm. Right? Who's measuring that? Like, how do countries kind of catch up? That's right. And also it comes from a point of like being Malaysian, growing up in Malaysia. It's like, at least for me, I didn't feel like we were a big country. You know, I don't know if many people do, but it's like, I didn't feel like it was like a very significant country. Like you hear a lot about wow, US, China or whatnot, right? Like, you know, India, big countries. And then having, by that time, having a, some global exposure, living you know, in different parts of the world, I'm like, okay, where's Malaysia headed? And how about the other Malaysias out there? How about Indonesia? How about, they are market leaders in any industry. And there are also challenges in every market. Now, in the world of countries, there are superpowers, there are market leaders. Okay, that's China, India, uh, China, uh, China and US, for example, market leaders. The rest of us, we're challenger countries, you know. We're like startup countries, you know. We're trying to <laughs> find our place. That's true. You're right? we're, we're challenging the incumbents. We're trying to carve our niche, you know. So that fascinated me. Because if we can unlock what helps countries get ahead faster, then you would actually have like a playbook or a formula to help multiple countries kind of rise together. Mm -hmm. And then the, the disparity between a richer country and a poorer country will be less. Then the power dynamics will be very different. Mm -hmm. So for me, I was very fascinated with that, that idea. I was also fascinated with how technology and finance, those are two things where you combine both of that. You have this non-linear, way to scale. It's like the new economy is defined by finance as well as technology. Because it, every new customer you serve with finance, you don't specifically need, it's just the ones and zeros on a ledger, right? You don't actually need, need a new piece of wood, for example, right? Every new customer you serve with software, again, you may not need, like these days, maybe you need compute power, but not necessarily you need a lot of hard costs, right? So I think the, and for me personally, having used technology and finance to create wealth for myself, I'm like, what if all these other countries, not just Silicon Valley, also had power of technology and finance? And that their entrepreneurs and the people who are a bunch of could be 20-something kids like me back then, what if they could use their, their own ingenuity, technology and finance, to change their destiny? Can they create generational wealth in a span of a handful of years? To think that my dad, and, and full credit to his siblings, saving all the money for him to go to college, for him to buy computers for me, the money I made is more than his life's savings. So that's generational difference in a handful of years. So how do you give that gift to more countries? So I summarized it because at the time, uh, of course, like there's a, the globally, there was a term weapons of mass destruction, it was, you know, and, and say what you can about it. You know, but I was thinking differently. I was saying that, hey, how, what are weapons of mass creation? You know, what, it, what is it that people can use to actually change their destinies and create businesses, create outcomes? So that was a fascination. Right. And that fascination led me to angel invest my own money. So you asked me what I do with my own money. I, I just did 
I just exercised this. I met other friends from SMK DJ, you know, like Ching from iMoney, you know, he's come over my house, I designed a website for him, I give him some money, built a business, then eventually they got acquired as well. So I did a lot of angel investing and eventually led me to do venture capital. I bought a plane ticket to Silicon Valley to really understand how Silicon Valley did it right. I met with a lot of venture capital firms and for, uh, for some folks who may not be as familiar with venture capital, is venture capital firms receive money from very large institutions, you know, some comparables in Malaysia like EPF or say Kazana or whatnot, to use that money to invest in entrepreneurs. And when the entrepreneurs go public, exit, trade sale, and the companies get bought, that money goes back up and they pay what I call dividends of innovation. So that's what venture capitalists do. Silicon Valley, just, it's just like the capital of it, right? They kind of like popularize it yep. and they're still the world's best. So I have to learn from the best. Spending time over there, I realized a few things. Number one, at the time, this is about 10 years ago or, or more, most of the uh, American VC firms were not focused anywhere outside of the US. And number two is that a lot of really smart people in Silicon Valley are not from Silicon Valley. <laughs> they were from other places, you know what I mean? It's like the majority of it. you say that, yes. Yeah, and also the stats at the time, because I, I like to kind of you know, fact check things, is that 60 plus percent of entrepreneurs at the time were immigrants. So, yep. so the majority were not even from the US, you know? So Silicon Valley is like maybe a global melting pot. Maybe it's more of a mindset, mm. right? So the third thing was that the big difference then about Silicon Valley was that they had a relationship with money that investors were willing to angel invest. They're willing to, you know, to invest behind ideas. It's like you, you, you believe it so you can see it. It's not see it to believe it, you know? You know, you don't go with skepticism first, you know? It's their way around. It's like, I believe in you. Okay, give you money, let's go. Let's make it happen. It's very different. It's, it's totally opposite. Yep. So you can say what you want about, oh, why some, you know, whatever it is. But, but when I come back to Malaysia, it's totally the other way around. How many people are walking around angel investing in that way? Like you, th yeah. that relationship, that money culture is not there, right? So that's why I wanted to change. And because I had experienced changing it, at least for a very small circle, I said, okay, I'm going to need to do this. So um, the only venture capital firm at the time who had the same vision, uh, they were called 500 Startups back then. Now it's been rebranded 500 Global. Uh, long story short over there is I decided to say, hey, look, um, since all of you are building this all around the world, let me build it with you. And let me kind of like build out the Southeast Asian version. And I really had to prove to uh, people that um, it would work. Because if I did the first chapter and it didn't work right, then okay, end of story, I need to find some other thing to do, right? The first 50 investments we invested in turned out to be Grab, Carousel, Bukalapa. Wow. Yeah, so it's like FinXL, uh, Carsum, right? First investor in Carsum. So we had five companies that exceeded a billion dollar mark, one billion to 10 billion, of which three of them have gone public already, right? At least we, 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 we showed it's possible. And this is not just in, in Malaysia or Southeast Asia. 500 Global has now, as a firm, has invested in over 80 countries. We have over 40 plus companies that are worth more than a billion. And it's not even just about us. We talk about like the landscape of innovation today, over 55 countries has produced at least $1 billion plus tech startup. 55 countries, you know, not US, not just US, not just China, not just India, you know, 55 individual countries, you know, has produced over a wow. billion dollar company. Over 130 plus countries have startups that have raised venture capital money. So this story is something that is not just about us or me or whatnot. It's like this is actually a new era we're in where anyone can actually take their ideas and find a way to get money for it so that they can believe it and then see it and make it happen for everybody else. And that, I feel, is going to change a lot of how we experience life and that's going to solve a lot of problems. And that's what primarily the vision and the... the I mean, I've been doing this for 11 years now already, right? It's, yeah. it, 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 it's, a, it's a really fun game. Right? Wow, that's really interesting. Now, nonetheless, let's move on to the last question mm. I have, right? I believe when it comes to the to building startups, you know, um, becoming a founder, that, that's not a cup of tea for everyone, right? For most of the people out there uh, will likely end up working for someone. Mm. And traditionally, we are always geared towards working for MNCs, you know, I was talking to some uh, students in uh, uh, university and after all the conversation, and suddenly they tell me, they say that, hey, you know, one day uh, I wish I could work for the bank to learn their operation at bank. No, nothing wrong with that, uh, but we do see the other side where there are people who say that, hey, I noticed I don't really need to be a founder to be yeah. rich. Yeah. I can actually write along yeah. and become rich. Yeah. And you yourself, over the years of exiting a number of companies yeah. and then investing in companies, yeah. you've seen a lot of people who are not founders yeah. got very, very yeah. rich. So yeah. what's your thought on this? Like yeah. um, for Malaysians out there, I, I personally think for Malaysians, 
probably one of the best ways to become really rich is actually really working for startup. Yeah. And so what's your advice for the people out there yeah. looking for opportunity? How can they position yeah. themselves in a startup to ensure that one day they can yeah. become rich yeah. alongside with the founders? I think to unpack that, right? Like first thing is that this this idea that becoming a founder can get you very rich very quickly or at least like it's it's actually a huge myth. Number one, it doesn't happen very quickly. Because um, a lot of like the founders who build their companies, and even though the companies may be worth billions, it may not be public yet. And after the company goes public, they may not be able to sell all of their shares. Right. So the liquidity is quite limited and takes a long time. The average year, the average age to build a billion dollar company so far is about like between like eight, nine years, you know. And in some counts, it's like up to 13, 14 years. Some of the newest unicorns are about 20 years. You know what I mean? So it, so the get rich quick thing is just like it's just like yeah. a it's an outlier, right? That's right? It's not the average. It's not the median. Number two is about getting rich. There is dilution along the way. And number two is that there's a lot of sacrifices along the way. And not everyone's willing to make those low salary sacrifices, almost no salary sacrifices. Some people are not willing to do that either. So I, I think that becoming an entrepreneur is definitely not for everyone. And you mentioned about riding along. Like that's, I think, a very, very good strategy if you, wanna, you, know, if you, you don't want to take that much risk. But however, the way I see it is that riding along can mean a few things. Number one is that you can join a startup you believe in, hopefully get some stock mm. options, negotiate some stock options even. And then when the company becomes like, like gets a big financial outcome, you're going to get some too, yep. right? So that's that's one way. Now the next way is that you can use the tools of a startup to actually make money. Mm. So how many say for example web designers instead of using so I use Adobe Photoshop back then because there's no Canva, right? That's right. So I use Adobe Photoshop. Adobe Photoshop is like well, I think they're like 150 billion dollar company. I don't even really join Adobe Photoshop. But I use that tool and I also make money for myself, right? So if you, if there's like a very powerful tool, ChatGPT, whatever it is that's so powerful, what can you do with, with that tool that helps you make this money? Mm. Some people are selling things on Shopee, for example. They may not own shares in Shopee. They can, they probably should, but they are selling things on Shopee and making so much money too. So, so the people are making design with Canva. Yes, the exactly. The company, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I'm our first investors in Canva. We made, for our investors, we made a lot of money for, 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 for them, for Canva, one of our best investments. But, uh, but like I said, like if you don't have a chance to invest in Canva or work for Canva, maybe you can use Canva. Use Canva. Right, you know what I mean? Right, so, so that's the second one. There's a lot of different ways to, to do it. And the thing is that you don't even have to use Canva to start a business. That's not even a thing. You can use Canva at work, right? You can use ChatGPT, ChatGPT at work and you can become more productive. Then maybe you get promoted more, you get more responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, so that's like the second way. But I think the third way is that instead of just a company, you can look at an industry, like what industry is growing, and you get yourself involved in the industry in the first place. So my personal trainer, who is a uh, Af Afghan refugee, so he arrived here on, on, on shores of Malaysia, I think six years ago, and he's a big inspiration of mine. Because he arrived, he didn't speak any English whatsoever. And um, he taught himself English, but he's like a bodybuilder, it's, it's his passion, and then so he, 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 so he, he started to get clientele. And because he's such a hard worker, arrives way earlier than you, and he's so good at what he does, he started to amass a lot of uh, uh, clientele. But of course, a lot of clientele who can afford PT, like he wanted to be like them. So he built enough trust to talk to them about things like this. So he, when, so he asked me, he said, hey, uh, actually, if you don't mind, after getting to know me, you know, he's like, like, actually, if you don't mind me asking, like, what do you, what do, you do? So, I mean, I'm open with him. I, I, I trust him enough. Yeah, I talked to him about it. Then he's like, oh, technology. How, how do I get into technology? So I, I told him, I said, well, I mean, you, you can start by using it. But you see, a lot of people have these intentions of, like, using things. That day, right, like, suddenly he was replying me in WhatsApp. The thing is, his English is very broken, yeah? He's WhatsApping me in perfect English. And I'm like, what the heck? He said, oh, he started using ChatGPT to, on all of his WhatsApps. He's something like some professor or something when he's replying me, you know. So this, you know what I mean? He's doing it immediately, right? So then we're organizing our schedule and timing. Then I told him about like Google Calendar because I use Google Calendar. So the next PT session he showed up with, he bought a laptop, he invested in a laptop, and he's asking me, can you teach me how to use Google? And he's using Google Calendar for all the scheduling. So I said, okay, I saw teach him Google Sheets, uh, right? To plan all the workouts. He's, he's mind blown. He's using Google Sheets, like, whoa. Now he's sending me Google Sheets, PDF, everything. He's like, do you know what I mean? So how many people have the same kind of action, intent, action dynamic as my Afghan refugee trainer like him? That you, you, you see an opportunity to be involved in the industry and you start using things, right? So he's Googling, he's understanding different shares, he's, he's figured out how to actually buy shares of Tesla or whatever it is. You know what I mean? He's, he's getting in deep, man. So I would say like the first way is that, of course, you can found a company, you can start a company that is in a booming industry. It doesn't have to be technology, it can be anything else, a booming industry. You can, uh, you can join a company or you can use the tools, mm. right? So I feel like those three ways are 
some of the ways that you can get involved and benefit from all of this. All right, last question. Let's go back to the part of the employee part. Okay. Yeah? As an employee, if they're being offered share option versus bonus, right? Yeah. Uh, how should they make a decision in between these both? Well, I think individually, the first thing is that like, how much money do you really need to physically be comfortable? I think that's something to, to decide for yourself. And if you can lower that, then your options are more, right? But if you feel stressed and frustrated by not having a certain amount of money in your bank account, then you're not going to perform. You're not going to be doing peak performance. And so maybe you will suffer because you're, like, you're just constantly anxious, right? So if you really need the money, take the money, lah, basically. But the word need is something you want to question. Mm -hmm. Is the need so you can buy Starbucks every day or whatever it is that you want to buy? I don't know, right? Like, what's that need, right? So that's the first thing I'll say. So if your need for actual hard cash is a bit lower, then you got options. You literally, <laughs> you got the option to hopefully get some stock options. Lah. And you know, a lot of startup entrepreneurs would be happy to do it. Imagine, if, uh, uh, imagine, let's say in your company, someone, may, you know, may, maybe you, right? Like you, you go up to, <laughs> right? Go and say, hey, this, this six months, you don't pay me any salary. I got savings. I want shares in Mr. Money. Oh. Ah, oh. Suddenly, you look yeah, him differently yeah, already. It'll be a very good conversation. Yeah, man, not, not messing with your stuff here. <laughs> la, you know what I mean? But, but I mean, like, you know what I mean? Then suddenly, you're like, wow, man, who's this guy, man? Shit, man. Woo! Suddenly, <laughs> like, you, 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 suddenly, like you, you, you respect the person. You're seeing this person's like different. Mm. This person's in it with you. You know what I mean? You that's understand. Right. The right. belief in your company is the same level. That's right. Ah, different game already, right? That's right. That's right. But you can only do that if you're willing to have less. This may be for another episode, lah. But that's why I keep repeating about the psychology of money is very important to ascertain. So why is it people feel like every single month, every year, the salary needs to get higher and higher? It's because we've been conditioned for linear progression for all of our lives. Standard one, standard two, standard three, from one, from two, from three. Better, more, more, more. Upgrade, upgrade, upgrade. All these things are all such part of our operating system that when this year is the same as next year, Versus next year, I interview people sometimes. They say, oh, this your, you perform so well as a company. How come you leave the company? They say, oh, because my pay is the same for three years, so I'm not happy. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. And I think that, that that's a very respectable position to have. But why are you not happy with the linearity? That's also interesting to me, right? So, of course, I, I mean, I'm pro-progression and all that, right? Don't get me wrong. But if you're willing to actually take the same or take less, you have more options. You can choose to actually quit the big company job and work in a smaller company. Big company may not give you stock options, but a smaller company might. That's right. Right? And it's the company that's in an industry you believe in and it, that company is booming and you love the product, why not? You know, early days, we hired so many people who use sales.com, you know, like, people are just like, right, you know what I mean? Like, we'll, we'll hire users of our product yes. who believe in our yes. product, right? Yes. Yeah, so back to your, your final question about employees or anyone in general, right? Like this, one day you're an employee, Another day, you're like a part employee, part entrepreneur because you're like doing some side business at night. Another day, you're like a full-on entrepreneur. Another day, you're like an investor. A country is only as rich as the ratio of people who are like just um, co pure consumers and, and they, they're not creating any income or maybe they're like, uh, maybe they're they are, they are employed, white collar employed, or maybe they're like small business owners and entrepreneurs or they're investors, or they're philanthropists and people doing charity. Okay, let's talk about our family. La. Imagine you've got a family of five kids, right? One like, is, is a child that always needs and just cannot earn money because like, the, the, your baby mm. son is still, your, yep. your brother is still. Right? But then one is actually an employee earning some money. Another one is like a gig worker, perhaps, right? And, and making some money. Then one's an entrepreneur, full-on business. And then one's like an investor investing money. And then one is like a, someone who's doing a lot of charity because they've got an abundance mm -hmm. of their money to do it as well. Countries are very poor if they've got too many people who need. That's right. You know? And some countries are very rich because you get more people actually investing and like creating business, right? So I would say that if you bring it back to the big picture, all of us at, along our lifetimes, we may shift our roles yep. and we may do all five. You may be an employee who ha and you may own shares in a business as an entrepreneur. You start something, but you go back to get a job, for example. And you may, you may also do charity at night and so forth. So again, I wanted to at least stretch the thinking of people is that in this very moment in 2024, as you and I are talking, this may be who you are. One day you could be my investor too, mm -hmm. right? And I've seen that happen a lot in my life. We, we can almost reincarnate nonstop within this one life that we're in. That's right. And then so hence that fluidity is open to us. And I really hope all the audience tuning in, they continue to tune into your channel and learn things, you know, so they have more options and they make, make the best decisions for themselves. So thank you very much, Kylie, for sharing with us all your thoughts just now. I really think that we can actually do another episode. Yeah, there's okay. a lot more that we can talk about. Uh, for the audience out there, I hope you get to learn a thing or two as well. Uh, if you're looking for a job and you're thinking about joining the startup industry, I think it is really something that you should consider. And for me, my biggest learning today, right, is the idea of the margin of happiness that you can get mm. when you're willing to 
have your needs, you know, minimized and mm. questioning your needs. I would encourage everyone to think about that. Yeah. What is truly a need to you and how to increase that margin of happiness? So thank you very much, Kylie, once again. We'll see you next time.